Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Most of this, uh, most of this paper is based on parts of some chapters from a, a book which is entitled Medicine in the Age of Commerce and Empire, Britain and its Tropical Colonies, 1660 to 1830, which is being published by Oxford University Press later this year. Uh, it's an enormous topic, um, and this paper, although I've begun it in 1770, um, well, this talk, although it begins in 1770, still covers an awful lot of ground. And I thought that possibly by limiting it to the, the last part of the, the book and also limiting it to the Edinburgh connection, I'll be able to make the talk relatively succinct. But the problem is Edinburgh, as Steve points out, permeates nearly all of the connections <laughs> with the British Empire, and it's in a medical sense and in many other senses too. And so it's... Um, no small task, actually, to try to, to <coughs> bore down these connections into a, a talk which is, I hope, is going to last the standard 45 minutes. Um, what I'm going to talk about primarily is one of the main themes in the book, um, but to look at it mostly with the, the lens, through the lens of, of Edinburgh and its connections with the Empire. Now, one of the, or I suppose the main theme of my book is really the contribution of what was happening in the, in the colonies, particularly the tropical colonies, predominantly British India and the West, End, and the West Indies, to the um, process of reform that convulsed British medicine, particularly in the early 19th century, but which was also part of a steadily ongoing process through the 18th century. In 1827, the Scottish... Um, physician, Charles Maclean, he may have had an Edinburgh connection, it's not really clear um, whether he did or not, he celebrated what he called immense changes that occurred in the world of medicine, not just in Britain, but also in other countries, obviously France, over the last three decades. And he was referring to the emergence of something which he and others termed rational medicine or occasionally scientific medicine. And what he was emphasising particularly was a method of investigation and practice which was empirical uh, rather than based on book learning. It was one which embraced experiment in all manner of ways, scientific trials or medical trials, usually conducted in clinics, sometimes even uh, what might be termed a sort of primitive form of laboratory medicine. And of course so also the occasional increasing by the, the early 19th century use of quantification to, as, a, as a way of um, settling medical disputes or, or ordering medical trials. So th the question which many historians have asked when looking at this period of reform is, of course, how and why did it come about? Now, the standard interpretation, which has now obviously been revised quite a lot, is that the it was really the impact of Paris medicine, of the, the great tumult that was occurring in the medical and political senses in Paris in the 1790s, which contributed to the reform of medicine in Britain itself, to some extent, even during the French and Napoleonic Wars, but particularly after 1815, when growing numbers of medical, uh, of, uh, medical uh, students from Britain and many other countries flocked to the wards of Paris to see for themselves how this new form of medicine was being conducted. And this was a form of medicine which was based on uh, very much upon morbid anatomy, uh, took also increasing interest in physiology, um, but was, base, was quite different, um, at least according to most accounts, from the kind of medicine practiced in the 18th century because it was about finding deep knowledge, knowledge uh, Met forms of medical knowledge which were based on an, uh, an understanding of, of uh, the lesions of disease deep inside the body or the processes which led to them as opposed merely to surface phenomena such as symptoms. Um, and it led to an entirely different form of medical practice 
very ably described by Achnet and later by Foucault, which was termed uh, path um, uh, clinico-pathological medicine by Foucault. No, it's this form of, it's this, this sort of contagion from France in the medical sense, as well as in, at least initially in the form of some of revolutionary ideas that, uh, that historians tended to emphasise. Um, but more recently, particularly over the last couple of decades, the, uh, the focus of inquiry has shifted somewhat. People have become more willing to look at um, reform in Britain and other countries occurring even before the 1790s, before any kind of influence uh, from Paris medicine was really that uh, prominent. And people have looked at, at a, a number of, of institutions and, and developments which may have led British medicine to, to shift towards a more empirical observational experimental orientation in the years before the 1790s. Ulrich Troiler, for instance, has emphasised the growing rise of quantification, particularly <coughs> institutions such as the, the, the Royal Navy. Um, the rise of what's often been termed hospital medicine has been emphasised very, very much by historians such as Gunther Risse and uh, Susan Lawrence, looking at Edinburgh and London hospitals respectively. And some historians have focused specifically on the stimulus provided by warfare, the expansion of the army and navy during the 18th century, and how this led to an increasingly empirical orientation in, in medicine and medical practice. Um, Hal Cook, works of Hal Cook, Peter Mathias are among a number of those. Um, right. right. Okay, but this is a focus, even when historians have begun to look at, in, at organisations such as the Army and Navy, which are obviously operating outside of Britain, which has nevertheless remained very much focused on Britain itself and British institutions. Curiously, what's happening, or what was happening in many other parts of the world, parts of the, what becoming the British Empire, have, although been slightly acknowledged in some of the literature, have not really been examined that seriously. Now, this is, I, I think, a, a glaring omission. And as I, became, as I really got deeper and deeper into, into researching this, predominantly in the context of India and the West Indies, I began to find evidence of types of medicine which were, in some senses, very similar to the kind of new forms of medicine which supposedly emerged in, in Paris in the, in the 1790s being performed in the hospitals, the military and naval hospitals of the, the East India Company, the Army, the Navy, in India and in the West Indies and in other locations. And also I was finding evidence, not just of the, that these practices were occurring in isolation, but they were occurring in a kind of dynamic relationship with, um, with reformers and other important developments occurring in Britain but also in many other countries, in some continental European countries, and also in the American colonies, and later, of course, in, with the, the New American Republic. So what I begin to find, or a bit what I began to find, was really that there was a, a, a network, or a whole series of interlocking networks, I suppose more accurately, of reform-minded individuals, medical practitioners, predominantly surgeons and apothecaries, a few physicians among them, stretched across the British Empire with connections outside of the empire who were engaged in very similar projects and who in some cases saw the empire as a kind of broader canvas in which to, on which to pursue some of the interests that they developed, for instance, back in, back in Edinburgh. Um, but it's too simplistic just to see, if you like, Britain and the reformers in Britain extending their influence to other areas and just seeing the empire as a kind of giant laboratory it far, became far more complicated than that. Because although, as I'll say in a moment, Edinburgh provided and other institutions in Britain shaped the outlook and the interests of people who were going out to the colonies, the colonies themselves formed very increasingly important sites of innovation which began to feed back into the reform, uh, the, the kind of <coughs> reforming um, uh, process within Britain itself and began to alter the kind of teaching 
which was occurring in institutions such as Edinburgh and other places, and also the nature of medical texts. But even by the, by the late 1790s, it was clear that many uh, physicians back in Britain, including members of the physician elite that many of these <coughs> colonial surgeons were criticising, were beginning to take up their work and to incorporate it into their own writings and also uh, into their own medical practices. So basically, just to sum it up my, before I go on to look in more detail at Edinburgh, my argument is that the emergence of what contemporaries referred to as modern or uh, referred to as rational or scientific medicine had many roots. It had roots in Paris, it had roots in the infirmaries of, say, Edinburgh and Vienna and, and other European capitals. But crucially, it also had many important roots in the empire, and the empire was a really important engine of reform much more important than anybody has ever realised, I think. Now, as far as um, medical work in the British Empire was concerned, by far the single most important, the single most important institution while in shaping the outlook of practitioners who went overseas was Edinburgh University. Um, by the middle of the 18th century and by the end of the, the period that I'm looking at too, Edinburgh was producing most of the, um, or was uh, some sort of affiliation with Edinburgh was evident in the case of most of the surgeons who were going into the, the, the army, the navy, the medical services of the East India Company, both the military service and also the marine service, which was distinct, and also many of the civilian practitioners who were working in um, overseas locations, for instance, occasionally for the Levant Company or for... Um, or as plantation doctors um, and uh, private physicians in the West Indian islands, for instance. Most of these had some connection with Edinburgh at some point in their career. Many had attended lectures at Edinburgh in sciences and medicine for usually between one and three years. Most left without a degree. Some came back, in fact, quite, quite a number came back subsequently in their career once they had more funds to take an MD. Um, but even before going to the colonies, many of these medical practitioners had received training at Edinburgh to some extent. Um, and the kind of training they had really coloured their outlook initially, very strongly, in the colonies. But although they rejected much of the detail, ultimately, of what they'd been taught back in Edinburgh, the methods in which, by which they approached, say, the study of, of disease, for instance, were coloured, remained coloured very strongly by the training they received in Edinburgh. For most of the, the 18th century, what's very evident is a very strong natural historical orientation, which is something which, which was very evident in the way that, um, both in the way that medicine was taught in Edinburgh, and also in, the, in more, especially in the teaching of botany here. There's also a strong interest in chemistry, of course, taught by uh, very important uh, chemists such as uh, Joseph Black. Um, very strong interest in chemical therapeutics, for instance, overseas, that no one has really looked at before. And Beddoes and other the famous pneumatic physicians back in Britain took a lot of inspiration and, and knowledge from, from work done overseas, often by Edinburgh-trained um, doctors. Very strong interest in morbid anatomy, and the colonies provided them with ample scope to be able to explore, or to develop that interest. Uh, really, from as far as I can see, from the 1750s onwards, in most military and naval hospitals, and the hospitals of the East Indian Company, dissections are being formed almost as a matter of route, performed as a matter of routine there. And so, from that point on, from the middle of the 18th century, medical practitioners working in these hospitals, and of which are there quite a number, uh, are able to correlate post-mortem signs of disease with symptoms in a way and develop a system of medicine around that in very similar to the system of medicine that was developed later on in, in Paris. So these are all some of the hallmarks of medicine as it was, as it was developing in the tropical colonies and which were coloured to a large extent for, by the experience at Edinburgh, but not exclusively because by the end of the century in particular there's, uh, there's quite a lot of medical practitioners coming into the Army, Navy and the East India Company who also have received some training in the London hospitals, the anatomy 
at the anatomy schools there, or often, very often, both in Edinburgh and London. That was very common. Now, later on um, in the century, because of the importance of the colonies as a, uh, as a um, and of the institutions such as the army and the navy uh, as a source of employment for many of the, the medical practitioners leaving uh, Edinburgh and other such institutions. Um, it's of course not surprising that we find many of the teachers at Edinburgh themselves have important experience or formative experiences overseas. <coughs> if you look at Cullen's lectures on fevers, for example, they're they're, they're, they're clearly based to some extent on his work as a ship surgeon, his experiences in the West Indies. Later on, moving into the early, the early 19th century, uh, George Ballingall, second Regis Professor of Military Surgery at Edinburgh, gave extensive lectures on the diseases of the tropics, based to a large extent um, on his own experiences in the East Indies. Now, in 1770... I would argue that there's already a very well-established network of colonial medical practitioners belonging to these armed services of the East India Company, but also uh, private individuals as well, to some extent, who are parts of this network. And this network builds up very steadily from the late 17th century onwards, but the crucial phase of its development occurs in the middle of the 18th century. And it's a Seven Years' War, really, that provides the main stimulus to this. It really enlarge, massively enlarges both the number and the size of military mm. and naval medical establishments overseas, both the overall numbers of people and also the numbers and the quality of the hospitals as well. Many of the, the old hospitals are knocked down and new ones are built, making it easier to perform dissections and so forth. Um, but also, crucially, during the war, people are often travelling from one location to another, particularly some of the naval surgeons. Um, and also large numbers of what are often termed tropical invalids from the army and the navy are being sent back to Britain. Those that don't die en route end up in hospitals such as Haslar, where they're treated by James Lind, among other people, who is looking at the, you know, looking at the fevers, dissecting some of the, the people who die from these diseases. So as a result of all of this, there's a growing, growing interest in the medicine of warm climates, or, or hot climates. At that point, it's not usually called tropical medicine, although people write about tropical diseases. But what you see by the 1760s is the emergence of a relatively distinct branch of medicine, distinct even from military and naval medicine, although it obviously overlaps with it to some extent. Um, and it's really typified by James Lynn's essay on the diseases of hot climates, 1768. As I said, Lynn's experiences at Haslam were very important in this. Um, he never actually went, as far as I can tell, to the, the colonies at all, but he had this experience of tropical invalids. But he also had a, a very large correspondence network which extended across the British Empire and outside. And on the basis of his own experiences with invalids, his correspondence and his reading of the what by this stage is quite a large literature based on individual countries such as the colonies such as the West Indies or particular colonies like Jamaica and the East Indies, he was able to put all this together and, and write a very comprehensive text on the diseases of hot climates really the first of its kind that embraces the whole of climates and this is indicative of the fact that this uh, kind of relatively <coughs> distinct, distinct branch of medicine has emerged now at the same time it's clear that these practitioners in the colonies are becoming quite self-conscious. Uh, they're beginning to assert their independence and their authority, which is based on first-hand knowledge of fevers. Now, they really want this both ways. On the one hand, they want to claim that their experiences are unique, that the, the diseases, diseases in the tropics are, are quite distinct from those in Britain. At the same time, particularly once they've come out of the army or the East India Company, they're searching for positions back at home, they're wanting also to, to claim that this experience, say of treating fevers, is applicable to the, the kind of medicine um, which uh, applicable to medical practice back in Britain. And many of them do that, for instance, in that by, um, by claiming a particular 
by claiming that the, the knowledge of treating fevers overseas can be useful in modified form to treat fevers in Britain. And many of them find employment or indeed involved in setting up, as I say at the moment, institutions such as fever hospitals back in, back in Britain. Now, they're very conscious also of the, the differences from physicians. They're very, very hostile to the Royal College of Physicians in London, which, of course, which is a preserve of an Oxbridge-educated elite. And they're, they're really sort of, in their rhetoric, they're setting out a kind of uh, stark dichotomy between their kind of empirical knowledge based on observation and the book learning of the physicians in London. Of course, many of the physicians in London are also very interested in experimental medicine. But they, they kind of set things up in that way. And you can tell that they're becoming very, very assertive and very critical of, the, of medical orthodoxy back at home. And quite a number of these um, medical practitioners working in the colonies, and of course many of the ones who have Edinburgh connections, are also quite linked, uh, quite, linked quite um, closely linked to or members of dissenting networks of natural philosophers and physicians. The most famous ones being around uh, the Quaker John Fothergill, also the Lunar Society and so on, and also groups of alumni, particularly associated with uh, institutions such as Edinburgh. And these all provided informal channels through which the knowledge gained in the colonies could go back to Britain. Now, this, sort of, this, this emerging attitude is summed up uh, very eloquently by um, one of the, the kind of most strident radical physicians of the early 19th century, Charles Maclean, in 1817, when he says, the great, writes, the great independence of mind which prevails among the faculty in the East and West Indies, but more especially in the former, from the superior organisation of the East India Company's extensive medical establishments, not only admits of, but even enjoins an increased freedom of investigation of which an efficacious as well as a more discriminating practice is the inevitable result. So, going back to the quotation that I opened with from Maclean, talking about the immense changes that occurred in medicine, it's, cl it's clear that Maclean himself thinks that many of these, the source of many of these changes, is the work done in the colonies, particularly in the East India Company, where there's a very, very large number of people by this point. By the early 19th century, there are over 600 medical practitioners working in the company's armies alone, not to mention the marine service. So it's a huge medical establishment. You can see how they can be, you know, they're, they're quite self-referential, they're quite, um, pr that, that they can be, um, that they can assert their, depend their independence without really feeling very defensive. And Maclean, of course, you, well, you may think as a former East India Company surgeon that he would say that, but many other people are saying the same thing, including people who don't go to India, including people, for instance, who are fellows of the, the College of Physicians of London, which many of these uh, colonial practitioners were criticising. They're acknowledging that in areas such as fevers, understanding them and treating them, in, in areas such as morbid anatomy and also in the use of some new drugs, particularly chemical therapeutics, the use of mercury for non-venereal complaints in the form of calomel, that the, that the surgeons in the East Indies and the West Indies know these things better, and that if we can adapt some of these things for practice, um, quite orthodox practice, in London, for instance. So what I'm just attempting to convey here is that although Edinburgh training is shaping the outlook of practitioners who are going there, the, same, the, the actual experience of working in the colonies at the same time leads to a growing independence from those institutions, which is also summed up in the case of Charles Curtis, an Edinburgh trained a medical practitioner in 1807, where he's, talk, he's here talking about his uh, former teacher, Cullen. European nosologists provide uncertain or fallacious guides to the diseases of hot climates, and therefore you need to sort of start afresh when you get there. Now, this is just a picture of the military hospital in Barbados, just to give you, you can see it in the, in the background there, just to give you some idea of the kinds of institution that <coughs> I'm talking about. Um, now, I, I've got a few examples. I'm not going to have time, I think, to sort of go through them in as, quite as much detail as I would have liked, but I'll sort of 
skim over some of the um, probably the less important parts. Now, in order to, to kind of illustrate the nature of the connections between Edinburgh and what's happening in the colonies, I've picked a, a few examples to, to show, to really to highlight different dimensions of these connections. I'm going to start first of all with John Clark, who are, who's a, like most of these uh, colonial surgeons, and most of the people going into the Army, Navy, and the company was, uh, came from relatively humble origins. Um, originally went to Edinburgh to study divinity uh, uh, as a Unitarian. In other words, he was a dissenter, again, like many of them, but switched to medicine. Like most of the practitioners who, in the, in the colonies, he, who went to Edinburgh, he didn't take a degree immediately. He, he left. He didn't have the funds to stay to take the MD, and he joined the company's marine service. He worked in the Madras Hospital, which is quite a large, fairly modern hospital, uh, in seven, for three years. Um, his main concern with what were, was what were then known as putrid fevers, probably uh, severe forms of malaria in most cases. And he examined these in a natural historical way in relation to the climate and the, fact that the meteorological factors which he thought produced these diseases and also by looking at the history of the disease within the body through post-mortem dissection and relating that to, feel, to the symptoms of patients while they were still alive. Now, like many of the, the, the practitioners who were working in the tropics, he emphasises the unity of fevers and the fact that they can mutate from one into another. Of course, it's tempting to see a connection uh, with his kind of Unitarian beliefs, believing that there's simply one, uh, that there's one godhead, like there's one fever, but I don't think that's the case because the basically the same attitudes are prevalent through many, in, in, in the case of many of these um, colonial surgeons who presumably not all Unitarians. Um, like also many of the, the people coming out of Edinburgh into the, the company's service and working elsewhere in the colonies, he stresses the importance of improvement, which really becomes the, the kind of the, the ideological taproot of British imperialism in the 18th century. So cultivation um, um, uh, of hitherto wild lands is, is seen to be a kind of de rigueur to the kind of the sense of an imperial mission, which is unfolding, and also something which is seen to be beneficial to health at the time. Also, reforming of conditions on board ships and among establishments overseas, the European settlements, better diets for soldiers, seasoning to get them used to tropical climates, and a whole range of other things are he's kind of putting forward while he's still in the company's employment. In all these senses, he's really very <coughs> typical of practitioners who came into the, the company from Edinburgh. Now, after he leaves the company's service, he really maintains the same kind of reforming impulses. Um, he moves, actually, because uh, quite a number of these people seem to do, I'm not, not exactly sure why, um, to the northeast of England, uh, where they find employment in, uh, in, what are, sort of in expanding industrial towns and ports. Um, he has a practice at Newcastle upon Tyne, where Thomas Trotter later also establishes a practice, another very famous naval surgeon, Edinburgh, training. Uh, he becomes physician to the new <coughs> infirmary there. He joins the Unitarian congregation, uh, which is very dynamic in terms of natural philosophy. Um, and li and uh, is sort of, his membership overlaps with a great deal with the, the medical and physical society in the town. He uh, is instrumental in setting up the dispensary for the poor. He's putting forward smallpox uh, inoculation, first of all and later on uh, vaccination after Jenner's discovery. Um, and he's pressing very hard for a period of years for a house of recovery, a fever hospital, predominantly for the poor, and for the, the setting up of a board of health to control fevers. Of course, this is really like many of these, um, many of these initiatives, a form of enlightened self-interest. Nobody, nobody at the time really wanted large fever outbreaks among the poor because it would there's always a danger that these would spill over into kind of more affluent areas. But nevertheless, there is a very strong reforming element here, which we can trace all the way from Edinburgh through the company's service and into, into Newcastle. And as in the case of many of these fever hospitals, there's a, there's a big debate, or very uh, um, bitter debate, about its location. Of course, no one really wants one of these hospitals close to them. 
although they, many of them, most people think that it's a good idea in some way, but they don't want it close to them. And so he has, this, he has to convince people in the town, um, A, that they need a hospital, but more particularly that it needs to be located centrally, because that's the, in a med, from a medical point of view, that's the most useful place to have it. And in order to do this, he enlists the support of a considerable range of people, which again illustrates the, how the, the kind of networks of reform-minded people that were kind of existing throughout the empire at this time. And it's in interesting that many of the people who were enlisted in this campaign to set up the fever hospital in Newcastle were Edinburgh people who had some sort of overseas medical experience. James Lind, um, George Cleghorn, James Curry, who ends up as a practitioner in Liverpool with important West Indian connections. A whole um, series of people. Uh, but uh, many of them, people have experience in the colonies with, in the treatment of fevers and how to manage diseases of populations. This is really what this is about, transferring experience about how to manage diseases within a population, large population rather than individuals, from a military or naval or colonial context into a civilian one in Britain. So eventually this, uh, the hospital is set up, but then he, he dies almost as soon as it's set up. Uh, but it, it continues to, to run. That's the infirmary rather than the fever hospital in which he worked. Now, I don't really have much time to, to go into this, otherwise I won't have time to talk about my other example. But basically what I wanted to show, that the kind of work that he did in the fever hospital also reflected the, the work that he was doing in the hospitals in the East Indies. He was using the same, more or less the same drugs uh, he was using calomel in particular, mercurous chloride, to treat a whole range of fevers in the, West, in, in the, in the hospital in Madras. And he, used, he transfers this to the, um, the, the infirmary in Newcastle and recommends it for the treatment of fevers back at home, but in smaller doses. The, the doses of mercury that they were giving in the colonies were truly staggering. <laughs> and so he knew that there's a controversy about that and he had to kind of tone it down. But by the early 1800s, through people such as Clark and many other um, colonial, um, uh, colonial medical practitioners, the use of mercury in the treatment of fevers and digestive disorders has become very widely diffused throughout the whole British Empire, and indeed even into continental Europe. Whereas in the 18, 1760s, it was something that the College of Physicians in London had been very, very critical about. By the early 19th century, even the, the, the London physicians are beginning to incorporate this into their medical practice. And I don't have time to go into this, but it basically all started in, in Madras in the 1750s as a result of an initiative by two Edinburgh-trained medical practitioners in the Madras Hospital. I can speak more about that in questions if people want to know. Now, just to go on to my last example, I think I should just have time to do it. I'm going to talk a little bit more about therapy, but um, a little bit more about the West Indian connection in particular, um, and about a kind of the, the important changes which are taking place both in the colonies and at home with regard to therapeutics around the, 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 the beginning of the, the 19th century. Now, what we see in the, the 1790s is the very wide distribution of nervous theories of disease, such as those which are taught by, most famously by William Cullen at Edinburgh, and also by his rebellious um, former student, John Brown. And this displaces in the colonies what has become the dominant medical paradigm really since the, the 1760s. And this is based on the, on the idea that most diseases, from nearly all fevers, uh, hepatitis, dysentery or flux um, were caused according to, this, according to this paradigm by excessive bile and the idea was that the liver being, which is thought to be the most sensitive organ in the body would be overstimulated by heat produce too much bile which couldn't be used up in digestion which form blockages in viscera um, and also which would be which, and also would lead to bile uh, becoming corrupt um, within the body, giving rise to a whole range of symptoms. And 
the thinking was that you need to use purgatives, often very drastic purgatives, such as large doses of calomel, to get rid of this from the body. So uh, starting off in India and then spreading to the West Indies and other places, a whole series of, um, you know, a series of practitioners were using mercury to treat a wide, very wide range of diseases, including yellow fever in the, in the West Indies, which was redefined as a, a bilious disease. But in the, from the 1790s onwards, these theories of disease and the, the therapeutic regimen based on calomel, largely on calomel, which was part of that, were being displaced by people who um, believed that diseases were primarily disorders of the, the, the nervous system, or at least that the effects of climate and other things took their form, took, um, um, had an effect primarily upon the nervous system, which then affected the rest of the body. Now, as part of this, two competing systems emerged to challenge the paradigm that I was just talking about. Um, one was a variant of Brown system, um, a kind of Brunonian system, and the other was a return to bleeding, um, which was distinct from the Brunonian system, although there were some overlaps with it, which was pioneered in particular by another Edinburgh-trained medical practitioner called Robert Jackson in the West Indies, and later on by another Edinburgh-trained uh, um, medical practitioner, George Ballingall, in the East Indies. Now, I'll talk first about Brunonianism, um, which is a topic I know that Michael Barfoot obviously is a great expert on. It's one of the reasons I wanted to, to, to use this as an example. Um, now, there's been, um, over, well, there's been quite a lot of written about Brunonianism in the past, but not much work on it recently. And uh, I think that many of the Many historians, such as, um, such as Michael Barfoot and uh, Christopher Lance and others, always suspected, I think, that there's quite a lot of Brunonianism in the tropics. But um, until, uh, until now, I don't think there's actually been that much research on it. What I want to concentrate on, um, in particular, some of the most obvious disciples of, of Brown, or uh, kind of self-proclaimed disciples of Brown, which were Charles McLean, who I mentioned earlier, and so called William Yates, about whom it's very hard to find out anything, really, until his time, uh, until his, he, he really goes into print. Um, and what they did was to pioneer and popularise a modified version of Brown's system in the treatment of, of mariners at the Calcutta General Hospital in the late 1790s. Um, McLean, at least, was previously employed by the company on a, on, on, as a ship servant, a surgeon, and he was using a version of Brown's medicine on those ships too. Now, as many of you will know, John Brown's medical, um, or his theories of disease were radically simplistic. Basically, he believed that all diseases were either derived from having the nervous system too overstimulated or understimulated, and therapy was basically designed to, to correct that imbalance. That's a, an oversimplification, but that's all I don't really have time to go to in, in, in detail. Um, McLean and Yates believe something very similar, although that they, they kind of claim to be doing things somewhat differently from Brown, whereas Brown had suggested that some diseases were, were due to overstimulation. Yates and McLean placed emphasis on, most emphasis on debility, and they believe that all diseases are basically due to debility which they term direct and indirect. Now, the latter, indirect ability, is basically diseases are diseases of exhaustion brought on by massive overstimulation of the system by exposure of European bodies to the tropical climate. Again, that's an oversimplification. Now, they also differ to some extent with, De with Brown over various forms of treatment. Um, Brown thought that certain medicines could be debilitating, particularly medicines used as emetics and purgatives. But um, Yates and McLean saw many of the medicines normally classified as purgatives or emetics as stimulants, and that included calomel, for instance. And these would administer a small shock to the system, and they would they'd be used to, to kind of raise the system from debility to a state of health. They used a wide range of stimulants, well, what regarded then as stimulants, anyway, things like wine and opium, of course, have very soporific effects, but they, initial, they, they kind of administer a small shock to the system, and that was thought to be stimulating and to raise the, 
raise the nervous tone. But also calomel. And they were using calomel, just like all the other East India Company surgeons, the more orthodox surgeons, but they were using it for entirely different reasons. The other company surgeons were using it mostly as a purgative. They were using it as a stimulant, along with these other things. And that got them into trouble because they were challenging the military medical establishment of the East India Company. But they were challenging a lot more than that. And this is where there was a very close link between <coughs> Brunonianism in the tropics and radical politics, just as there was back in Britain. <coughs> now, as historians have pointed out already, there's no automatic connection between Brunonianism and political radicalism, although that was more evident in Britain than it was in other countries. Um, but there was, nevertheless, a kind of appeal um, to radicals in Brown's system because he was somebody who wanted to strip away non-essential elements in medicine to concentrate on what he thought were the basics, the kind of, the, the, the kind of simple laws of the body system and how to, to recalibrate those, uh, how to recalibrate the balance in the nervous system. Now, this simplicity appealed very strongly to... Um, physicians uh, to uh, medical practitioners working overseas in the colonies, men such as Maclean, and I won't read it out but you can read it uh, for yourself that in the colonies because the mortality rate was so high and because um, death would often come upon a patient sometimes within 24 hours of them um, exhibiting symptoms um, there was a, you know, a great deal of um, a consternation among practitioners there about how to deal with these, these diseases. And in the past, this had led them to, to use mercury in very large doses. To, they thought that was the only way of clearing the system and, and possibly saving the patient. But for, for uh, McLean, a brown system was attractive for a sort of similar reason. It sort of gave them a kind of certainty, um, a kind of plan of how to deal with these diseases. It was, it was very simple. Um, uh, but it was also a way of challenging the very elaborate prescriptions of many of the, the elite physicians. Um, it, and that was something that appealed particularly to McLean and, in fact, many of the, the company surgeons, the army and navy surgeons, because they, they, they tended to set themselves up as being quite distinct from and in opposition to elite bodies such as the College of Physicians with their book learning and so on. Um, but McLean himself was very actively involved in radical politics back in, um, in yeah. India as well as back in Britain later on. He was actually denounced by the Governor General of India at that time, um, R.C. Wellesley or Marcus of Wellesley, who was the, the, the brother of the future Duke of uh, Wellington, as a turbulent demagogue and a Jacobin. This was during the uh, fears of Jacobin agitations in, in Calcutta. And Maclean actually was editing a broadsheet uh, which was uh, very radical. And as a result of that, Wales the, um, gets him expelled from India in 1798 on a pretext, actually, of, um, uh, of slandering a, a magistrate. In fact, he just wants him out because he's a nuisance, because he's challenging the medical establishment and he's fermenting radical ideas in Calcutta at a time when they're very concerned about French teaming up with Indian rulers and inst instigating insurrections in India. And when he comes back to Britain, which he does in very strange circumstances, which I don't have time to talk about at the moment, he uh, launches a campaign against the company and Wellesley in particular, say how the company has become a kind of despotism and Wellesley's equivalent to Napoleon and so on and so forth. Later on, he retracts <coughs> a lot of this and because he thinks he can then get some sort of employment with the company again and starts, starts, starts then um, defending the company as trading monopoly. But he remains an ardent champion of freedom and of, uh, of uh, campaigning against oppression really to the end of his days, although he's also uh, in some ways a kind of contradictory figure and um, also has, you know, is, is involved in quite a few things which are um, quite scandalous, including sort of various financial improprieties. Now, I'm sort of running out of time, so I'll just sort of summarise the rest of my other example very quickly. Now, the other big challenge I was going to talk about was Robert Jackson, who an Edinburgh-trained uh, medical practitioner who goes to the West Indies, first of all as a civilian, then 
during the American War of Independence becomes part of really the Army me Army's medical establishment. Gains a great deal of experience there, experiments with new ways of treating disease, which are bloodletting, which at that time is kind of almost unheard of, apart from one or two mavericks there. The, East, the, the Army's establishment is very much one which was using calomel, ideas imported from India. But he challenges this. Later on, he goes back out to the, the, the West Indies during the French Wars. He's elevated eventually to the post of um, Inspector General of hospitals there. So he's in a position of great power, unlike Maclean. And he's, he uses that position of power to basically um, extend his system of bleeding throughout the army. Um, particularly in the West Indies. And then he also, because of his Edinburgh connections, is able then to get bleeding taken up um, by um, many people back in Edinburgh who don't even go to the colonies. Um, and he's kind of aided in this by the fact that after the conclusion of the Napoleonic Wars, quite a number, or even, in fact even before, quite a number of people who were trained in medicine at Edinburgh, who went into the army during the wars, come out and take an M go back to Edinburgh to take the MD, and they write dissertations, which um, all attest to the value of bleeding and how important Jackson has been as an, as an influence upon them. And as a result of this, according to some of his, some of his uh, uh, very ardent followers, or we could almost call them disciples, like Hector Maclean, James Maclean, all Edinburgh trained, in the, in the most part, um, he gets a great deal of influence in Edinburgh, and bleeding is taken up at the Royal Infirmary, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it becomes the, the dominant form of treatment for fevers in Edinburgh, as far as I can see. Um, Ballingall, who I mentioned earlier, is doing pretty much the same thing in the East Indies, trying to push bleeding there to displace calomel. It's not quite so successful, but it's reasonably successful there. And of course, he comes back to Edinburgh, and he also incorporates these ideas within his teaching. Although, unlike Jackson, he seems to have been influenced to take up bloodletting by the example of the French. Jackson appears to have um, <coughs> adopted it as a result of speaking to <coughs> one or two um, mavericks, civilian practitioners working in the West Indies. But then you can see how through these combined influences for the influences of France, the influence of the colonies coming back through Jackson, that how things change, come together to change practice back in Britain. Now, th this leads into my main conclusions. Um, first of all, Edinburgh, preeminent among British institutions in shaping the outlook of colonial practitioners, not the only influence by any means, but the most important one. The kind of relationship between Edinburgh and other British institutions and the, the major sites of medical innovation in the colonies is a very complex one. It's not a simple core periphery relationship with a centre is sort of sending out practitioners with set ideas um, and they're basically doing the bidding of, of, of metropolitan or British institutions. It's um, not that simple. Sometimes British institutions are the dominant influence and sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're actually quite marginal. Um, sometimes the colonies are become in effect the, the centres of medical knowledge. Knowledge circulates around through these networks, which overlap, uh, in sometimes in formal ways, through the structures of the army, the navy, occasionally for the Royal Society and other institutions like that. But it also circulates in through informal networks, and they're equally as, if not more important, sometimes through um, extensive contacts of Edinburgh alumni, which extend to the, the, the New World, to the Americas, people like Benjamin Rush are very much involved in, uh, or you know, co corresponding with and uh, connected with many of these colonial physicians that I've been talking about, and through a stem to dissenting networks such as the Lunar Society, for instance. Now, the knowledge which is generated, the new forms of knowledge, were often quite antagonistic to teaching back in Britain, including it even at Edinburgh. Um, sometimes actually returns to Britain and become the mainstream. Sometimes it's echoed in the teachings of people like Cullen, later of Bang, sometimes it's echoed in practices, the, the use of growing use of calomel, later of bloodletting. Now the relation of all these, these developments to Paris medicine, going back to 
my sort of first points, is very complex. These is probably best to see the the innovation which is occurring in the colonies and elsewhere, uh, in um, not necessarily as a, as a kind of alternative to the developments taking place in Paris, but um, sometimes acting with them in quite complementary ways. And in fact, some of the main interlocutors, the people who are who were in the early 19th century who were attempting to popularise Paris medicine, are people who were doing some very similar things in the colonies themselves. One of the most important of these is James Johnson, um, a physician who, were, who had Edinburgh connections, among others, um, who was set up and edited for a long time the Medico Chirurgical Review, which introduced many British practitioners to, um, to continental influences, emphasising things like morbid anatomy and so on, all things that Johnson and many of his um, colleagues in the Navy, the Army, the East India Company have been doing for decades in the colonies. But I think, despite the fact that the influence of Paris is still very important, what we need to take account mm. of is that we need to, well, I suppose we, we really need to expand on our current analytical framework, our current way of explaining why this new rational, more scientific medicine emerges. And in the process of that, we need to acknowledge, I think, that Western medicine has many of its roots planted outside of Europe, in the colonies in particular. Thank you. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to RCPE ac.uk slash heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.